Brothers, sisters, siblings, welcome to the Vermont-Palestine Conference, the struggle for land and liberation. My name is Ashley Smith. I'm a member of the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. We are now into a year of Israel's genocidal war on Palestine. This is a joint war carried out by the United States and Israel together. The Biden and Harris administration has been a co-partner every step of the way. It has helped coordinate it, fund it, arm it, deploy its aircraft, ships, and missile batteries for it, and provided political cover for it. Together, together the U.S. and Israel have massacred over 42,000 Palestinians in Gaza, half of them women and children. The Lancet estimates that nearly 200,000 people have been killed in the last year. Nearly two million people out of Gaza's 2.2 million people have been displaced, many of them several times. They destroyed Gaza's schools, hospitals, and a majority of its homes and apartment building, buildings. They are not just killing Hamas leaders like Yahya Sinwar, not just resistance fighters, but the people of Gaza. This is not an accident because behind the resistance stands the Palestinian people, determined to win their country's liberation. So fighting the resistance entails killing people on a mass scale. That was brutally demonstrated earlier this week when Israel bombed the Al-Aqsa Hospital in Jabalia, incinerating an entire tent city filled with patients, including Shaban al-Dalu, who burned to death with an IV hanging from his hand. This is genocide. And the US and Israel have expanded it, not only in Gaza, but into the West Bank, and now into Lebanon, killing thousands and displacing over a million people out of Lebanon's six million people. And now they stand poised to launch a war with Iran. But the Palestinian people in Palestine and throughout the region and throughout the world have steadfast, steadfastly resisted the genocide as they resisted colonialism, occupation, and, and apartheid for decades. We are here today in solidarity with their resistance, the resistance of Palestine's indigenous people, and the resistance throughout the Middle East against US imperialism and the apartheid state of Israel. Their resistance has inspired an unprecedented outpouring of solidarity around the world. For over a year, we have marched, sat in, and organized campaigns on campuses, cities, and workplaces in solidarity with Palestine and its struggle for freedom. In the spirit of solidarity with the indigenous people, I want to read a land acknowledgement about this country and its genocide and what it's done to Native American people for the last 400 years. We are on the historical homeland of indigenous people. We honor their rich history as the traditional and ongoing stewards of these lands. We know that this land is unceded, European colonialism carried out massive violence, ethnic cleansing, and genocides to steal their land. The US is a colonial and imperial power that continues this dispossession of native land today. We honor their historical and ongoing resistance of indigenous people to settler colonialism. We support their struggle for justice and self-determination. We must commit ourselves to active solidarity with all struggles of indigenous people from the US to Palestine and throughout the world. This conference has been brought together by the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation for three key reasons. First, we want to educate people about the real history of Palestine, a history of resistance against settler colonialism and imperialism. Second, we want to connect people committed to Palestine with one another in this state, in our towns, in our cities, on campuses, and in workplaces. 
Third, we want to inspire people to commit themselves to doing something for Palestine. The time for talk is over. The time for action is now. Everyone should leave to here today with com concrete plans to take action in one, two, or three different ways. That can be anything from personally boycotting Israeli pod products to joining our rallies, becoming a member of the coalition, and participating in one of our working groups. And we have two key initiatives that we want everybody to join in today. One. We want to get you to help us to put apartheid-free ballot measures on all town meetings in the spring of 2025. We need people out canvassing their towns and cities, collecting the signatures, and setting the groundwork so that the state of Vermont can vote against apartheid. When we vote against apartheid, that sets up every single town and city and the entire state to launch a campaign for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against this genocidal regime in Israel. We need you to take action. There is a sign-up sheet at the back of the room at the Apartheid Free Communities table for people to start canvassing in Winooski and Burlington this coming Saturday. What you do matters. What we all do together matters. It matters for Palestinians and it matters for us, especially in Burlington, where our craven Democratic Party dominated city council blocked our right to vote on the apartheid free resolution last year. This year, we will not be turned away. We ain't going to let nobody turn us around until we win our democratic rights here in this town to vote against apartheid. Two, we want everyone to support Students for Justice in Palestine at the University of Vermont. Their encampment last year at the UVM campus inspired everyone throughout this state, along with Middlebury, Dartmouth, and Sterling, and other campuses that launched encampments. UVM is launched a McCarthyite witch hunt against Students for Justice in Palestine at UVM. Without a trial, they suspended SJP, disallowing it its right to meet, its right to protest, its right to free speech, its right to assemble. To defend the apartheid state of Israel, UVM is censoring people at the University of Vermont. So we're back to the Berkeley free speech movement back in the 1960s when people protesting the war in Vietnam in Berkeley had to fight for their right to speak, assemble, and protest against US genocide in Vietnam. We need everyone to support UVM SJP today. You can donate to their defense fund because they brought a legal court case against UVM. We need everybody to support their struggle. Their struggle is our struggle. When anyone is under attack in solidarity with Palestine, we're all under attack. We have to rally to their defense. This conference would not have been possible without the generous support of many people and organizations that I want to thank. First, we'd like to thank the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series, which gave us a donation so we could rent this space, so that we could meet freely in the city of Burlington, not subject to state and university repression. We'd like to thank, in particular, the Old North End Community Center and Mi'kmaq Sering, in particular, who has done yeoman's work to help organize all the chairs, all the tables, all the meeting rooms that we'll be in today. So give a round of applause to Mi'kmaq. We'd like to thank the AALV, which gave us a room on the third floor where one of the workshops will be. We'd like to thank Patrick St. John for designing the beautiful poster that you saw on social media and on your walls of the cities. So thank you to Patrick. And not 
And last but not least, we'd like to thank Fareed and the People's Kitchen for feeding us today. Oh, and I forgot one. I'd like to thank Haymarket Books, which has set up our live stream, which is going out to tens of thousands of people on YouTube today. So a big thanks to Haymarket Books. I got a lot of finally. So finally, um, I'd like to thank our organizing committee, who for the last five months have been doing heroic work, tireless work, to pull this all together. Samia, Jackson, Katie, Emily, Nick, Michelle, Antonio, and Henry. Give a big round of applause to them. And one of those key organizers that really keeps us all organized. Katie is gonna give some announcements about how the conference will work today. Give it up for Katie. Hello everyone, welcome. We're really excited you're here. And yes, there was an organizing team, but this is not about us presenting something to you, it's about us all joining together. So there is a place for everybody in this movement. We will win. The people united will never be defeated. So I just want to make it clear this isn't about us presenting something to you. It's about inviting you into the work. And there's a place for everyone. But I have some logistics just to make sure everybody knows where to get the things they need today. Um, first, Michelle and the Marshfield Village store have donated a lot of snacks and coffee and tea. That's over to your right in the front of the gymnasium. So please help yourself. That is all free and available for you. There's still coffee left. For water, there are refill stations by the bathrooms. If you go out of the gymnasium on your right and on your left. <laughs> We're making more, so don't worry. Um, so if you don't have a water bottle to use that refill station, feel free to grab a cup from the snack area to use. Please don't forget to be drinking water, especially if you're here for the day. Um, bathrooms are outside the gymnasium. If you take a right, there's a women's restroom. If you take a left, there's a men's restroom. And there is a gender neutral restroom. If you go in the area where the elevator is, it's on your right hand side. So it might not be apparent and there's one on the second floor and on the third floor, a gender neutral bathroom. I don't see, we have childcare available. Don't see any kiddos hanging out. You can hang out here too, or find me for childcare. Um, our COVID policy, so it's on the program, but we just wanted to announce it as well and um, perhaps provide a little bit more context. Masks are required for all attendees, except when you're eating or drinking. And we do ask that um, when you're, if you've been eating or drinking and you're finished, then you please do put your mask back on, especially during the lunch portion, which will probably be a longer period of time than you'll actually be eating. Um, out of respect for each other, the entire community, of course, remembering that some people are more impacted by this and we keep us safe and this is a disability justice issue. And also we don't want everybody in the cause getting sick. So it will help all of us to do that and we appreciate your help in that. If you don't have a mask, there we do have some at the registration table. Um, speakers are have the option of taking their masks off while they're speaking, and they have all um, test, done a COVID test before attending. Let's see, elevators are available. Um, as Ashley mentioned, there is one workshop that's on the third floor. So we're also gonna do a couple other announcements after this plenary, so I'm not gonna give you all the information now, but. Everything for the conference is on this floor except for that one workshop. Um, there's also stairs, stairs available. If you go all the way to the right-hand side and the left-hand side, there's stairs if you don't want the elevator. I think that's good for now, yeah? Okay, we'll do, we'll do a couple more um, explanation of the program and announcements of where to find workshop rooms after the concluding of the session. Thank you all so much for being here and we're looking forward to a great day. Thank you, Katie. Um, our first panel today is entitled Palestine Today, War, Genocide, Resistance, and Solidarity. 
We have a wonderful panel of speakers, and I'll introduce them in their speaking order. Um, and you should give them a round of applause when I introduce them, or n everybody except me. So first, we have Arya Aber, who was raised in Germany, where she was born to Afghan refugees. She is an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Vermont, author of the award-winning collection of poetry, Hard Damage, and author of a forthcoming novel, Good Girl. Give it up for Arya. I'll be... Sp I'll be speaking after Aria. I'm a member of the Coalition and the Tempest Collective, and I work on Spectre Journal, which we have copies of over there at the Tempest table, a special issue on Palestine I encourage everybody to get. And I'm co-author of a book called China in Global Capitalism. <laughs> then we have Samia Abbas. Samia is a Palestinian-American activist, community organizer, and mental health worker. She is also a 2024 fellow with the U.S. Campaign for P Palestinian Rights. She organizes locally with the Southern Vermont for Palestine and the statewide and statewide with the coalition, uh, the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. Give it up for Samia. And last but not least, we have Kali Akuno, who is a co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson, author of Jackson Rising Redux, and board member of Cooperation Vermont and the Cooperation Vermont Community Land Trust. Give it up for Kali. First, please welcome, please welcome Aria. Hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor to begin today's conference with some poems. Um, they're very quiet, but also loud at the same time. And I stand here as a writer, primarily as a poet, knowing the limits of language, aware that poetry and writing is only a small part of the process towards Palestinian liberation. When I teach, I ask my students, what is the responsibility of the poet? And I mean a poet writing in English in America here today where our tax dollars fund the very bombs that rain down on children, on pregnant women, on young and old men. 902 entire families have been wiped off the planet in the past year alone, just in Gaza. I think of Palestinian-American poet Fadi Judah saying that the responsibility of the poet is to strive to become the memory that people may possess in the future about what it means to be human. Or I think of Palestinian-British writer Isabella Hamad writing recently, and then afterward she wrote to a lecture she gave just a week before October 7th, quote, do not give in be like the Palestinians in Gaza, look them in the face, say, that's me, unquote. So I like to think of the poet's utterance as a reminder of our humanness, as Judah writes, and for this reminder of our own humanness to move us off the page and into our bodies, into the streets, into the world and toward each other, to look at the other as Hamad implores us and see yourself. Poetry may not be revolution, but as Adrian Rich wrote, it is a way of knowing why it must come. I want to start with a now famous poem by Dr. Rafat Alarir, a brilliant English professor and intellectual who was a poet from Gaza who was martyred in an airstrike by the Israeli military last year on December 6th, along with his brother, his brother's son, his sister, and her three children. He wrote this poem in 2012. If I Must Die, by Rafat al -Arir. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even 
to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. Thank you. Um, the next poem is by Palestinian American poet um, Zena Al Sous, who works in the labor movement in southern Florida. This poem was published in Jewish Currents in April 2021. <laughs> And I read it as a call to action towards solidarity to the workers of the world to unite and imagine a revolutionary future. The workers love Palestine. The week before the sun announced hospice, my great, 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 great grandchild, the harpist announced, workers of the world join the strike for guaranteed light. The florists' union in Caracas and the Algerian weavers presented joint proposals toward illumination that multiplies. Bare hills, lakes of salt, sutured dim ruins, shadowless, of shipping yards and empires, of memories of sarin. The children's council listened in wreaths of yellow iris, patterned leaves designating each role did you know that within attunement to effort, the end of monument resides? Then the harpist, my progeny, that fate I had so long evaded, debt I owe to demographic warfare, and names sliced open, reborn and disfigured repetition, sang, sang 300 years of returning. Language is merely the placeholder for what the land has always known. Species being is an observation of mom, preface. Absent, the wet painting of a raised village, sold. The land is land, land is land, land, land. I am coming home. Um, I want to conclude with a poem by Fadi Judah, which was published in February of this year, um, as part of his book that he has been writing in real time in the aftermath of October 7th. Fadi Judah is a Palestinian American poet from Texas. His family is from Gaza. He has lost over 100 family members in the last year. And this poem is untitled. Plum line. For the longest time, I heard it as plum line. I adore a perfect fruit, its flawless groove, revealing division, remaining one. Your earth is lead that poisons the stream of my memory. Your phosphorus plums me to the bone. I know how it came to this. How did it? More than words, you speak in silences that amplify white spaces in which white is not water. It smells, I can taste it. And water is life, closer to life than dirt and stone. Dirt and stone. Is that what you love most to taste? I spin and raise my taste and smell into a love like water. How will I go on living with orchestras that conduct my thirst? It's been done before. There are precedents, always will be, and there will be a Gaza after the dark times. There will be gauze, and we will all stand indicted for not standing against the word and our studies of the word that dissect what ceases to be water. Why do you crave plumbing the depths of dust so? Dust and ashes, I'm ahead of my time. My time is only mine when you're in it with an open heart. An open heart has two ears, two eyes, one set for breath, one for blood. And the dance between them, grooved like a plum. I will survive, there is no better song. 
My body knows my memory is my keeper beyond the loss in which you're hooked on naming. Can you be water? One day you will be that kind of divine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aria. Um, if people who are sitting next to empty seats could raise their hand, there are a lot of people who need seats. So if people want seats, fi just follow these hands and you can come and sit with everybody else. So just try, we'll try and get more chairs for the second plenary. <laughs> there are a lot of people here today, which is a good thing. Um, when I just heard Aria um, read the poem from, the, from Florida about workers of the world unite, I couldn't help but think of the Greek workers who shut down the port just in the last two days in Greece to stop weapons delivery to Israel. A big round of applause for that action. They are showing the labor movement how to fight. So I'm supposed to talk about the war today. And the first thing that has to be said is that this war did not start on October 7th, and it did not end on October 7th. It is the product of what Rashid Khalidi calls Western imperialism's 100-year war on Palestine. First British and then US imperialism set, supported the Zionist settler colonial project to establish the state of Israel. They needed a reliable ally in the region to enforce their dictates. Britain saw the region in the, in the late 19th century and early 20th century as a gateway to its colonies in Asia. After the discovery of oil, the US saw the region as pivotal to control that, uh, to, as pivotal to control, because whoever controls the oil reserves controls the key commodity that fuels global capitalism. And they were very blunt about it. The State Department declared in 1945 that these reserves constitute a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. If you want to understand why the U.S. is in the Middle East and what it's, why it's fought relentless wars and supported the Zionist settler colonial state, three letters answer the question, O-I-L. Oil is what the primary interest of the U.S. is in the region, not supporting Jews, not bringing democracy, but it's terrorizing the whole region to ensure it controls that oil. The U.S understood that it could not rely on the rest of the region's states. Why? Because even the reactionary pro-Western states in the region were not reliable allies because they feared their people's opposition to imperialism and their solidarity with the struggle to free Palestine. Even worse for the US, those states were repeatedly threatened with revolution to replace pliant regimes with nationalist ones, with socialist ones, with ones opposed to US imperialism. Therefore, the US turned to Israel as its local cop with a settler colonial population utterly hostile, fundamentally racist to all the people in the region. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz put it most clearly, declaring what Israel's role in the Middle East was. They said, Israel is to become the watchdog. That explains why the US has funneled tens of billions of dollars into the Israeli war machine over the last several decades. As genocide Joe Biden declared in 1986, supporting Israel is the best annual and I quote, $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interests in the region. That explains why Western imperialism supported Zionist colonization of Palestine, its ethnic cleansing to set up the state of Israel in 1948, its imposition of its apartheid state, its occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and it, Israel's current genocidal war. The threat to this setup has always been the Palestinian people's fight for liberation. And that fight for liberation resonates throughout the entire Middle East, in the Iranian population, the Arab population, and people throughout North Africa. 
Their liberation struggle is just like the other great liberation struggles in the 20th century, from India's fight for independence to, Alge to similar ones in Algeria, Vietnam, and South Africa. Today's war is a direct product of this history and present of imperialism, colonialism, and resistance. U.S. imperialism managed to get the Palestinian Liberation Organization to sign the Oslo Accords in the early 1990s. It gave up, the PLO gave up the struggle for a singular secular democratic state in historic Palestine in exchange for, for the formation of the Palestinian Authority on a fraction of Palestinians' original homeland in the hope that it would eventually become a Palestinian state. But Israel has refused to grant one. Oslo was a trick to entrap the liberation struggle, and Israel and the U.S. knew it. Israel has instead relentlessly expanded its settlements, and the U.S. has turned a blind eye to that expansion, and even worse, has ratified it. That led to the resistance outside the PLO, both popular resistance and through Hamas. Hamas rose in popularity not because of its ideology, but because it opposed Israel's relentless colonization, murder, and state terror against the people of Palestine. It won the election in 2006, leading the Palestinian Authority, backed by the United States, to carry out a coup against Hamas. That, in turn, led to Hamas seizing control of the Gaza Strip. The U.S. and Israel then turned to divide and conquer tactics to fragment Palestine and its resistance. It subjected the West Bank to relentless colonization and imposed a siege on Gaza, turning it into the world's largest largest open air prison, a prison of 2.2 million people. At the same time, the U.S. attempted to re remake the Middle East through its wars in Iraq, hoping to install pliant regimes to serve its interests throughout the region. Instead, it suffered one of the, its worst defeats in history, on poor, par with its defeat in Vietnam. That defeat was a victory for our side. When the U.S. loses, the world wins. That defeat enabled the rise of Iran as a regional power and its network of allied states, including Iraq, Syria, as well as forces like Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen. The U.S. was forced to double down on its historic alliances with Israel and various reactionary Arab states. All of these states were then faced with mass revolts from below after the Great Recession, the so-called Arab Spring uprisings that swept the region over the last decade. But all those went down to defeat. The U.S. took advantage of that moment to normalize relations between its bloc of states and Israel through the Abraham Accords. China pushed for normalizations of relations between the bloc of states it is allied with um, uh, to create a rapprochement with, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. All wanted regional stability to keep the oil flowing. Meanwhile, the conditions for the vast majority throughout the region, and especially in the West Bank and Gaza, continued to deteriorate. Israel relentlessly pursued colonial settlement in the West Bank, its siege of Gaza, and periodic mass killing in Gaza and the West Bank, and war when faced with any kind of resistance, whether it was nonviolent, whether it was popular, where it was military, Israel responded to all tactics with the utmost brutal repression and killing. Thus, the price of normalization was intensified Palestinian dispossession, occupation, and siege. Hamas and the rest of the resistance within Gaza staged October 7th as an attempted jailbreak out of its siege to call attention to the plight of Palestinians and to smash the normalization of the state of Israel. In response, Israel, backed by the U.S. and its European allies, launched their genocidal war. 
Israel clearly aims to implement their maximum program of ethnic cleansing, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. Israel actually tried to drive all Palestinians from Gaza into Egypt, but Egypt wouldn't open its borders to let the Palestinians in. So Israel has attempted to destroy Gaza and massacre its population. Israel's cabinet members now openly talk of genocide and the colonial settlement of Gaza. Israel has also expanded its settlement in the West Bank and threatens the ethnic cleansing of the West Bank today. Whatever crocodile tears Biden and Harris cry or whatever tactical disagreements they have with the Israeli regime, they have with Israel, they have with Israel, they have backed the genocide every step of the way. Over the last year, they've poured $22 billion into the Israeli war machine. Next year, they've promised another $20 billion to the Israeli war machines. That's why the bombs dropped in Gaza are US bombs. The 2,000 pound bombs that are dropped on hospitals, schools, apartment buildings are US bombs. The U.S. and Israel also see an opportunity to alter the balance of power in the region in their favor by targeting Iran and its allies. Except for the Houthis in Yemen, Iran's axis of resistance has been restrained during the genocide, launching symbolic strikes to avoid giving Israel an alibi for all-out war. Israel, however, with the full backing of the U.S., has attempted to pr provoke one, staging assassinations of the Hamas leaders like Ismail Haniya in Iran and then Hezbollah's leader Hasran Nasrallah in Lebanon. They provoked military responses and then have used those as alibis for their expansion of the war on Palestine into Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, and Iran. They have already implemented the Gaza plan in Lebanon, blowing up whole towns and cities and driving one million people out of a pre-war population of six million from their homes. The U.S. has bombed the Houthis in, Jem in Yemen, and now with the full U.S. approval, Israel stands poised to bomb Iranian military targets before the U.S. election. The U.S eager for this war, has deployed the TAD missile defense system along with 100 U.S. soldiers in Israel to protect and enable Iran, Israel to strike Iran. We thus stand on the knife edge of an even greater catastrophe in the Middle East. The hope amidst this horror is the steadfastness of the Palestinian people and the global wave of solidarity with their struggle for liberation. Here in the US, we have a particular role and responsibility. This is a US war, a joint war with Israel against Palestine and the people of the Middle East. We have a responsibility to do everything in our power to stop it and it's in our interest to do so. Imagine what the $42 billion they are using to fund, arm, and massacre Palestinians could do for the benefit of humanity. Imagine that money freed up as reparations to the Palestinian people so they can rebuild their society in their interests in a free Palestine. Imagine that money used to address climate disasters like ours two years in a row in Vermont, the new ones in Florida, North Carolina, and uh, elsewhere in the, in the South. Imagine that money paying for jobs, health care, housing, for all people. People know this in their bones. That's why the majority of people are for a ceasefire in the U.S. And a majority of people are today in the U.S. for an immediate arms embargo on the state of Israel. We have won the argument in mass consciousness to side with Palestine. 
Our task is to turn that mass consciousness into organized power so that we can do what the Greek workers just did and shut down the ports and airports of the United States to stop the delivery of the weapons to this genocidal war in Palestine. That shows that our liberation, indeed the world's liberation, is bound up with the liberation of Palestine, free Palestine. <laughs> Next up, we have Samia Abbas. Give it up for Samia. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Sweet. Um, wow, hello everyone, salam. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just want to echo what my comrades have said already, that you are all so welcome here. And it's, it's amazing to be in space with all of you. Um, and we're, we're really honored to host you for this conference, the Vermont Palestine Conference, the struggle for land and liberation. I've been asked to talk about the Palestinian resistance globally and locally, which is a pretty huge topic. Um, I will do my best. Um, and when I think about resistance movements, um, it seems important to situate us all here in this time, in the context of this time and place. Um, I want to start with the students. Are there students here? Can you raise your hands, whether you're high school or college? Yeah, rad. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah. Yeah, just, just for being here and just for showing up for this. Um, this spring marked the rise of what has been called the Student Intifada at over 100 universities and colleges around the US and also abroad. These encampments were universally expressions of collective power and collective liberation. They were united under the banner of calling for divestment from the Zionist entity, among other demands that seek to dismantle the deep roots of apartheid and oppression within academia. These students were met with violent police repression, vilification, academic and legal punishment, and they have continued to be surveilled, harassed, banned, and arrested. Universities marched in not only police to quash their struggle, but also external security firms, and the interconnectedness of campus police with local and state police departments, which became very clear during that time, um, many of whom, these police departments, received training from Israeli forces, is not new. The use of surveillance against students, just like its use against Muslims and Arabs in the United States and elsewhere, ground this response in a clear expression that the Israeli apartheid state is also the American carceral state. That's right. The enmeshment of administration, politicians, the media, and policing bodies points to their shared commitment to keep students and other protesters in their place and maintain the status quo. A status quo which invests in Israel not only through weapons and munitions, but also surveillance tactics, control strategies, and other systems that rely on authoritarianism and militarization. Later today, you'll have the chance to learn from students and others, abolitionists, other activists, about the connection between these struggles, Palestinian liberation, and the increasingly authoritarian and carceral systems of control. You'll also hear from activists who are organizing a campaign right here in Vermont to bring attention to the use of Israeli surveillance technology and healthcare in one of our local designated mental health agencies. The struggle for liberation is as local as it is global, and today will be a lesson in that. Another hallmark of this summer and spring was the historic Palestine Conference in Detroit, the People's Conference for Palestine. Yeah, was anyone there? Raise a hand, rad. 
So yeah, you know those who were there. Over 3,000 people convened in Detroit to discuss and connect and strategize and learn. That conference, its planning and implementation put Palestinian youth and Palestinian voices at the forefront. And because of that, from beginning to end, the linkage between these struggles became clear. Mm -hmm. The reason that Palestine has become a rallying cry for so many is that more and more people understand that what is happening in Palestine is not only a terrible humanitarian crisis fueled by a needless and vicious genocidal war, it is also a spiritual and moral crisis. It is a, gen it is a war against humanity. And the reason that we struggle together, that we must rise together, is to redeem our humanity. The chant goes, in our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. In our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. In our millions, in our billions, we are all Palestinians. In our millions, in our billions, we are all Palestinians. In the words of Palestinian writer and poet Muhammad al-Kurd, the rallying cry that we are all Palestinians must abandon the metaphor and manifest materially. Meaning all of us, Palestinians or otherwise, must embody the Palestinian condition, the condition of resistance and refusal in the lives we lead and the company we keep. Meaning we reject our complicity in this bloodshed and our inertia when confronted with all of that blood because Gaza cannot stand alone in sacrifice. What Palestinians teach us in this world of increasing fragmentation and dislocation, of hyper-capitalism and hyper-surveillance, is that we must resist their status quo. We must rely on our relationship to our communities to continually grow stronger as groups struggling for liberation. We must reject and turn away from the colonizer's logic in all its forms and the submission that it demands, its fear-mongering, its stifling, its muzzling again and again at every opportunity that presents itself. Today is a day for this, to map yourself and your community. Look around, you're here, you've arrived. Palestinians who are split into millions, experiencing our collective in millions of rendered states while continuing to remain steadfast in our collective resistance, provide us with a map to navigate this terrain. The resistance is global and it is local. I just want to, I want to scan out a little bit more. Um, Ashley put amazing words to this in terms of the historical context, context of resistance, but I want to say that pal Palestinian resistance did not start with October 7th a year ago. The US subsidization and funding of Israeli apartheid did not start on October 7th a year ago. The systematic devastation wrought by the Israeli apartheid regime against Palestinians did not start on October 7th, a year ago. Many of you, no matter wh where you are in this movement, have probably heard that echoed in the public consciousness these days, but what does it really mean? And I just wanna spend a few moments considering the historical context of this resistance movement, which stretches far beyond the events I noticed, noted earlier. Those who wanna go deeper should, should please come to Palestine 101, where there will be a lot more scaffolding of this. Um, from the very outset, Zionism was articulated as a colonialist project. Right. This comes directly from Herzl and Jabotinsky, who wrote that every native, Palestinian, every native population in the world resists colonists as long as it has the slightest hope of being able to rid itself of the danger of being colonized. This is what Palestinians, who he called Arabs in Palestine, are doing. And they will persist as long as there remains a solitary spark of hope that they will be able to prevent the transformation of Palestine into the land of Israel. So from the outset, there was a clearly expressed recognition that the intention of Zionism was always to minimize the indigenous population by any means necessary and maximize the settler population. This has always been at the forefront of the Zionist project. It was never simply a reaction to Palestinian violence or supposed hatred, though it is often portrayed that way in the media and in Zionist narratives. 
In 1948, a Nakba was the forced expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. Hundreds of thousands more were driven out by the subsequent wars following the creation of the State of Israel. But again, to be clear, and as Rashid Khalidi has said, this was not simply an act or result of war. This was an explicit and clearly grounded settler colonialist process, which sought to eliminate and barricade and sequester the indigenous population, just as has happened in this country, in South Africa, in other parts of the world. What is Jim Crow, is Bantustans, is apartheid, is occupation. To call something a war infers some sense of symmetry, and there is no war of equals here. Israel would not exist without the support of not only the United States, but the other colonizers of Britain and France, the Balfour Declaration, the Security Council, and the express ongoing financial and political backing of Western imperialism. So it is important to speak these truths and ground ourselves in a common collective understanding of why we're here, what we're fighting for, and what we're fighting against. I want to offer these words from the conference in Detroit as a powerful intention setting for this day and this time. Do not let the occupation's rage and blind destruction distract you from the absolute truth the truth is that there are no bombs strong enough, no fires hot enough, no prison brutal enough to destroy the spirit of the Palestinian people. We are not a people that can ever be destroyed. The occupation does not know that for the Palestinian people, the dead becomes the martyr, mm. the prisoner becomes the teacher, the besieged becomes the free, and the refugee becomes the key that will surely return to its rightful home. Mm. Victory is not an abstract concept or an unknown future. Victory is on the horizon. Mm. Victory is what we are here to organize for. All of you here today have been written into the history of the Palestinian people and into the history of this struggle. So how do we do this, achieve victory? From the historic moments of the past year, when millions have mobilized, gone into the streets, boycotted, showed up at city council meetings or select board meetings, called for divestment at every level, held signs, chanted, gotten arrested. One, we get organized. Mm -hmm. We join political organizations. If you haven't already done that, today is a day to plug in and to learn what's out there. Two, we articulate and we deepen our understanding of this fight which is to expose and dismantle Zionism and the Zionist project and all of the insidious ways this threads through our capitalist, colonialist, racist, fascist, and imperialist systems. Because we know that as long as settler colonialism exists, it seeks to destroy. Mm -hmm. And three, we strengthen, we grow a grassroots movement. We bring in more people from more parts of society, growing and expanding our reach. Each of you is an integral part of this because you represent countless others. That's right. You represent your community and the mass mobilization that is spreading across our country and wrapping around the world would not be here without you. So finally, many finalies, as Ashley put it, I want to end my time with something that comes directly from Palestinian political consciousness and storytelling. Palestinians run on sometimes, so that's my, my, my place. <laughs> Basil al-Araj, the martyred Palestinian activist, wrote about the experience of national liberation struggle and waging a people's war in Palestine through the metaphor of living like a porcupine and fighting like a flea. Quote, porcupines are night animals that live underground in a relatively large hole that connects to a network of tunnels. The porcupine, bear with me, the porcupine uses various techniques to get in and out of the hole, making the animal seem paranoid, or what we call in Palestine, a high sense of security. The porcupine has a significant presence in Palestinian popular memory and folk stories. The flea, too, has fascinating fighting strategies and techniques. It stings, it jumps, and stings again. It does not kill its host. What it does is exhaust its host, consume its blood, causing constant disturbance, eventually preventing the host from being able to rest. It makes the host nervous and demoralized. Mao Zedong says, the enemy advances, we retreat. The enemy camps, we harass. The enemy tires, we attack. The enemy retreats, we pursue. 
His theorizing on guerrilla warfare can be described as a flea war, live like a porcupine, fight like a flea. Our national liberation struggles today are global ones because the context of imperialist capitalism and colonialism is global and international as much as it is local and national. From Ferguson to Gaza to Vermont, Palestine is us and we are Palestine. The experience of the student intifada this spring and when we chant globalize the intifada and from Palestine to Mexico border walls have got to go and when we wrap ourselves in kafiyas and show up for black lives, indigenous lives, trans lives, Palestinians lives, solidarity is global and it is local. This today is a time to assess and reflect on our strategies and to continue developing our playbook for victory over the colonizer and liberation for the people. So today, I urge you all to come with discipline, come with focus, tune into yourself and notice what you need to do, what you need to draw on and from to be here and be present with your comrades. You are here to study, to learn, to think deeply about how to situate yourself within this movement. Know that you walk in a lineage, and today you are being invited into the lineage of Palestinian resistance. Welcome. From Palestine to Mexico, border walls have got to go. From Palestine to Mexico, from Palestine to Mexico. From Palestine to Mexico. I was thinking when um, Samia was talking about Mohammed El Kurd that Mohammed El Kurd was censored here at the University of Vermont. If people don't remember the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series, which is one of the sponsors of today's conference, invited Mohammed El Kurd to come in person to UVM last fall. The UVM administration, which is packed with Zionists, backed by the Democratic Party, which is packed with Zionists, in support of this genocidal war, censored Mohammed El Kurd denied him the right to speak at UVM because it was a threat to peace on campus. Think about the world turned upside down when somebody speaking against genocidal war is a threat to peace. That's the weird Orwellian world that Zionism introduces you to. That's why we're here to smash that Orwellian world and speak truth to power. Next up, we have Kali Akuno. Please give it up for Kali. All right. <clears throat> you all have uh, forced me to change what I had prepared to do, which is a good thing, uh, because it speaks first and foremost to the level of unity uh, that we have. And I think that needs to be recognized. Uh, that's important because you really can't build a political program of action without clarity and without unity. Mm -hmm. So to hear and see that, I think we need to note where we've come. Because we would not have been in a room in October 6 yeah. and had this level of clarity. Yeah. So I want us to be very cognizant of that, right? Now, what I'm going to try to speak to was supposed to, you know, what I was asked to do was about the kind of the international context. I'm going to try to weave it with some international context, but bring it home. Because as an internationalist, to me, that means very concrete things. It doesn't just mean abstractly fighting for someone over the other side of the world. It means bring that struggle home in my neighborhood mm -hmm. to my family and friends and make it as practical and as concrete to change the material conditions and the political outcomes that we all want and we all need. So I'm gonna try to frame some things in that particular way, so bear with me. <clears throat> um, you know, somewhat I draw 
a lot of inspiration from and tried to even model my own life after is Amla Carl Cabral. And if you don't know who he is, I would encourage you to look him up. And there's one particular phrase, which anybody knows me, I use a number of his phrases. Uh, one is tell no lies and claim no easy victories. Right. And what does that mean in this particular context? I'm here to share with you all <clears throat> that at this stage in the struggle, we actually need to be prepared to make more sacrifices, collectively. Collectively. Now, we have done a tremendous job of keeping the momentum going for more than a year. Mm -hmm. Do not discount that, mm -hmm. right? Too many of our social movements are only episodic, meaning they last for a couple of weeks, a couple of months at best, and then they fade, they dissipate, and they go away. You all have contributed to not, that not happening. <laughs> and that is important. That is very important, particularly in this day and age, wherein we don't have the mass parties of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? Which were, were enabled us to keep these types of momentums going. So the fact that we have done that within a more decentralized, autonomous way speaks to a level of political maturity that we now need to figure out how to better actualize that mm -hmm. to actually surface and manifest more political power and political power that will actually challenge the productive project of the productive process of the war machine. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? Greece was cited as an example. It's an example that we are overdue in executing here in the United States. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about one off activities because we've actually done that. That's actually happened. Let's give ourselves credit for that and recognize that. But to be able to sustain what it requires, meaning to disrupt the production of weapons, mm -hmm. to disrupt the logistical delivery of those weapons, that is going to require us to take the mass demonstration of people demonstrating the tens and the hundreds of thousands and applying that to direct action campaigns relative to those particular munitions and the logistic courses. We're going to have to be far more disruptive than what we have. That is what I mean by the first step in sacrifice. All right? And we need to get ready for that and not lie to each other about what is going to require. Now, we've done a whole year, I think, of raising consciousness, and sometimes you have to do that. Right? In terms of getting people to understand the degree to which the Zionist position holds sway within this empire. Yeah. Many people were not totally convinced of that. I doubt that remains the case for most of the United States today. Yeah. All right? Now, that is a growth. It's a growth that comes with a tremendous amount of needless sacrifice and suffering. But we are here and we are now at a point where we have to turn that into concrete political action. Mm -hmm. So there's a request of all of you to get yourselves prepared to join in with others, not in ones and twos, not in tens and twenties, but in the hundreds and in the thousands to be that disruptive force. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all are ready to commit that? And don't, don't be ashamed if, you, if you're not prepared to raise your hand. Let me be honest about that. That just means we have to work more on building the collective strength to get you to that point where you feel your sacrifice will not be in vain and you not will be left isolated or in prison and no one will come to, to be of your aid and assistance. So it's a goal, right? It's not, don't be ashamed. We have to work and build the confidence and capacity to get ourselves all there to where we need to go. Again, that's not lying to ourselves because we're not all ready to engage in that. And that's fine. The question is how do we get ready? All right, how do we get ready? What do we need to do to look at each other in the face and say, all right, I need you to help me in this particular way to move and take this position and understand the sacrifice. And when I make this sacrifice, my community won't abandon me. 
right, that there will be some support, there will be some aid, there will be some solidarity. Once we get to that particular point, then people will be willing to speak out against these universities or, you know, be willing to, to make some concrete challenges knowing that they, their tenure may be snatched, which is beginning to happen, yep. all right? Uh, but if we are very clear that we are going to be together, then it makes these type of sacrifices easier. And it doesn't just lead to a moral question of whether this person is down or that person was down. We have to eliminate that, and that requires organizing so that we change the material conditions that make that a political question and not just a merely a moral question. Mm -hmm. I hope folks are with me on that. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, the other piece, you know, I do want to speak to the international piece because I think it's critical that we understand the age in which we live in. I would challenge you all to recognize that we are living in a rapidly changing world. Mm -hmm. Rapidly changing on many levels. And I'll just speak to one that the valiant resistance of the Palestinian people has brought to the fore. And I would challenge you all to look at one thing October 7th did change. It is basically eliminated the false notion that colonialism was a project of the past. Yeah. And as exposed to the world, it is a very living essence of how capitalism and imperialism structure the world in the present, in the now. And if we let them continue to run the show, how it will be in the future. And what do I mean by that? Listen, I want everybody, you know, uh, uh, to, to go and listen to Kamala Harris's statements yeah. about uh, uh, Yahya's uh, assassination, which is basically what it was. She basically outlines a dictate to the Palestinian people and to Arab peoples in particular. You either do what we say or we will kill you. That is the essence of the statement. Do not lie to yourself about it. Read through it under lines. Like, oh, you know, we'll, there'll be a Palestinian state, but only if we say so. And only if the Palestinian people give up any notion of resistance and totally submit to living in a Bantustan and being in slavery. Yep. Be clear. Okay? And the resistance said, hell no. That's right. We are not living in that way. And the resistance has totally shattered, by way of the United States conduct in particular, any notion that they are about democracy, yep. that they are about human rights, that they are about a, a, a rules-based order. Mm -hmm. All of that has gone to the wayside. Nobody believes that crap anymore. Not that many people actually did anyway, <laughs> but it is gone now. And what evidence can I cite to you to about, about that? Now, this is world still in transition. But one thing I would cite to you is the South African case. Yes. Okay? Understand its importance. Is it stopping genocide? No. But is it a challenge to this false notion of a rules-based international order? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay? The same thing with the ICC case. Now, they tried to split the baby and said, well, we're going to you know, charge uh, a few Palestinian leaders and Netanyahu and some of the war leaders. But I want y'all to recognize one particular thing. This is the first time, the first time, this little kangaroo court has ever charged a Western <laughs> leader for anything, yep. any damn thing, okay, and put out some orders that should this person or these people show up, arrest them. Now, not many Western states are going to comply. I don't have no illusion about that, yeah. right? But it does restrict some of the movements, and that is important, particularly when you recognize that you can take almost any vote, and not just recently, but any vote relative to, to the Palestinian cause, be it about uh, the, the wall or be it about the, the illegal settlements, and it's almost unanimous that the vast majority of the nation states vote in favor of the Palestinians. Yep. Time and time again. All right, that means something. And what we need to, to kind of recognize in all of this, 
is the total asymmetry that still exists in the world. And what do I mean by that? It's not that, I would argue, it's not that the vast majority of people don't want to come to the aid of the Palestinian people, both at the state level and in the social movement level, is that particularly most of the nation states, folks need to be very, very clear. They, they exist in a state of utter terror at the destructive capacity of the United States government. The destructive capacity of the United States government, which doesn't just manifest itself in bombs so we're all clear. It also manifests itself in mass starvation campaigns and capital flight, which keeps people impoverished, which is just as maniacal, if not more so, than a bomb because it restricts your life force over a slow, gradual period of time, which is what they're doing to most of the nations that raise any particular question around what Israel is allowed to do by its United States benefactor, all right? Now, one, one last thing. I've heard a lot of people say it's not clear what we should be doing now, over a year. And some folks beginning to become somewhat disillusioned. Well, we've done all these marches. We did the student protests. What now do we do? The struggle is not just an aggregation of like tactics, mm -hmm. right? It has to be a long-term protracted thought because that is the nature of what this enemy is prepared to do and what we have to prepare to do. So we, it's a matter of building momentum. Right, and transforming consciousness, which is the prelude to transforming political power, mm -hmm. okay? We need to understand that a lot of the, the, the limitations that we are seeing on a global level is not because the movements are dissipating. They are actively being repressed. Look at Germany, if you want to understand some of the limitations that are going on and the extent to which these nation states are protecting their collective vested interests in this colonial project. Germany is not alone. England is doing much the same. Most of the other Western countries, including this one, are doing the same. And best believe, this is a point where the Republicans and the Democrats have a high degree of unity, all right? That they are going to try to limit political space in this country to be it so that any serious criticism, even of the, just the basic policies of the Zionist state, become an, an illegal act. Now, what does that mean? That means we're going to have to be prepared to go back to the first point, more sacrifice, because we cannot be silent. That's not at, on offer. But we need to be prepared to deal with the consequences of speaking up in this new political environment. So we're gonna have to have each other's back. That's the bottom line, right? And get more organized to be able to, in, to deal with this. So that's the gap to which I wanna speak to. But I think the road forward on how to deal with this, at least from our positionality, is very clear. We have to disrupt the war machine and do all of that, what, what that entails, okay? Well, all of that, what that entails, which means stopping it at the point of production and the points of distribution. So I want everybody to think about what that looks like in Vermont, what that looks like in New Hampshire, what that looks like in Maine and Massachusetts and this greater region. And I'm bringing that up because y'all got some facilities that make weapons for the United States that get delivered to the Zionists right here. That's right. And if you didn't know that, learn it and figure out a tactical and strategic approach on how to deal with it. Because solidarity begins here, right here. The action starts right here where you're at. You're in a vital strategic point to disrupt a critical part of this entire genocidal operation. Seize it and help liberate the Palestinian people and all of us because those two things are intimately linked. Do not think that they're not. Thank you. Thank you, Kali. I realized I forgot to tell the punchline about Muhammad El Kurd being censored, is that we did a virtual 
meeting for Muhammad El Kurd, and 11,000 people watched it. If he had come to UVM, we would have gotten hundreds. Their repression turned hundreds into 11,000 people. They cannot repress us. Do not let them intimidate us. We, if we are as steadfast as Palestinians, we are going to win. But this struggle is not a sprint. It is a marathon, and we have to be marathon runners for justice. And so we have to get our act together in an organized fashion. And that's the role of this conference. Number one, to educate people. Number two, to connect and organize people. And number three, to get people to take action. Take action, most importantly, collectively. And I think we want to start imagining what that looks like. Imagine every single campus not only has an SJP chapter, but that SJP chapter is a hub of all the campus organizations together coming out for Palestine. That we make Palestine an unavoidable issue for every other organization on campuses. Imagine in your community that every single church, synagogue, mosque, community organization joins apartheid-free communities. Imagine we get a ballot measure on every single town and city in our state where we can vote to liberate ourselves from apartheid. Imagine that we turn those apartheid-free community organizations and those ballot measures into campaigns for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, just like we did to apartheid South Africa. We brought apartheid South Africa down. We can do that to the apartheid state of Israel, if we're organized. <laughs> and imagine your workplace your workplace, where you labor for a boss to make profit for them with a union, with a Palestine caucus at its heart that is going to fight not just for bread and butter issues, but for a free Palestine. Because we know the U.S. spends a trillion dollars a year on the war machine. That's our wages. That's our health care. That's our housing. We sacrifice that so the U.S. can destroy people's lives around the world. Imagine a labor union, your union, organizing your workplace that understands that, makes it a bargaining issue in every contract, and is prepared to strike to enforce it. We cannot deliver that stuff tomorrow, but we have to have as a goal in mind. So all the small work has a vision of where we're, get, where we're headed, that we're in a marathon, but there is a finish line, and we are going to get there. And a getting there is a free Palestine and the collective liberation of all of us. Okay, I, there are two announcements that we have. One from Samia, do you want to do your announcement? About, okay. Please give it up for Samia again. Yeah, so um, just to name that for those who are here who are um, of Arab lineage, descent, Palestinian or otherwise, um, we're going to have like a caucus at lunch for folks who want to connect and be together um, and even just know that there are others here. So that'll be room 203 uh, to the right. Yeah, to the right when you go out of this door. Thank you. And there's a sign. And last but not least, Katie, with more announcements on how our conference is going to run. Give it up for Katie.
Hello again. First, I just wanted to give you a quick run through our program in case there's any questions. Actually, first I'll say welcome to everyone watching this stream. And the next stream is going to be at 5 PM. And it's also on the Haymarket YouTube channels. It's a different link. It's a different link. Thank you. Looking at the wrong camera. It's a different link. Um, but if you go to the Haymarket YouTube channel, you'll be able to see where it's counting down to it. So that's where you can find us at 5 PM for the closing plenary. And for everyone who's here in person, the program, if you don't have a program, there's a lot more available at the registration table. So feel free to grab one. Um, first, please don't join the Wi-Fi that's listed in the program. The reason is because we're using it to stream the conference. So it could affect the stream if too many people join. Um, so thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, inside the program is the schedule. So you can see we're moving into lunch and then the lunch portion will go until the first workshop block starts at one. The workshops are listed and you'll see the room number for the workshop underneath of it. I uh, just want to draw your attention to the defending our civil rights is room 305, which is not on the second floor. It's on the third floor. The other thing about the workshops is there is limited space in the rooms. They can hold about 40 people. So there is a chance that the workshop that your first choice will be full. And if that's the case that we ask you choose another one, there is going to be a workshop in each block held in the gym. So there will be plenty of space there. And if all the rooms are full, I don't think it will be an issue. But if it is, then you can always attend the one in the gymnasium. The other thing is don't forget there's a lot of great groups and artists and organizations tabling here in the gymnasium. So that will be ongoing if in between sessions and stuff you're wondering what the options are, then the gym is a good central place to be for that. Um, there'll be another break in between the workshops. It's on your schedule. And then also on the back of your program, there's more information about the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. Um, the website and information about the next meeting, especially for those of you who are in the Chittenden County area. Um, the next meeting is on November 2nd, so just want to draw your attention to that at the bottom. And for anyone watching the stream, if you are in the Chittenden County area or you want, you're willing to travel to the area, it's being held in Burlington and you're welcome to come to that meeting as well. Um, the other thing is remembering that we're all here to connect with each other as well. And that's something that can uniquely happen when we're gathered that can't necessarily happen virtually. So please take advantage and just let's normalize introducing ourselves to each other as much as you're comfortable, of course. Feel free to connect with those who are sitting next to you here in the workshop spaces. And we have some questions listed. So you can just be like, Katie told me to ask you this if you're not sure how to get started. There's some <laughs> questions listed in the program that you can use. Um, so that is a little overview of the program. Um, for lunch, I know I had a couple of people sign up to help with setting that up. I don't have that list in front of me, but if, that, if you were one of them, then please get ready to jump into that. Um, during lunch, so if you need to be in a, a masked space, of course, a lot of people will be removing their masks to eat and drink. Um, we're going to ask you to see the workshop rooms listed in your program. 203 actually is not one, so that's not an issue. Any of the workshop rooms we're going to say is a masking mandatory space during the lunch portion if you need a space to go where people will be masked. And also, of course, we want everyone to be able to eat. Um, you're welcome to take food outside as well. It's really nice out right now, and that might be a safer space as well. That's lunch. Um, Oh, and one other thing. So the uh, opening and closing plenaries are being recorded, and all the speakers consented to that. Please don't record the workshops for security reasons for the speakers and just because they didn't explicitly consent to that. You're welcome to take notes. Um, but please, no recording in the workshops. Is that everything? All right, that's everything. Oh, I guess. <laughs> If you still had questions that I did not address, the, probably the best thing to do is head to the registration table. And Jackson will be able to either answer it for you, or he'll be able to get in contact with one of the organizers who can help you out. Thanks so much. 
just just a couple of things before we break for lunch. So the lunch will be in the back on the right hand side when you're exiting. It will be at those two tables, and um, we have a quick explanation of the wonderful artwork that is up here hanging from the balcony. So Ian is going to explain the artwork. Please come up, Ian. So the artwork you see is called Najawa. It was created by Michelle Sales, who's an artist who repeatedly has provided artwork to support our struggle. It, remind, it was created in 2015 for the South Burlington Art Hop and has been displayed a number of times since then. You will notice that it covers the, uh, each decade since 1948. So it re reminds us, as has been said several times, our struggle did not begin a year ago last October. It, it began decades ago, here portrayed by, since the Nakba in 1948. The struggle actually began earlier than that, uh, was, as has been explained this morning. So thank you. Do look at the artwork and admire it. And we all thank Michelle Sales for having created it. So lunch will be arriving soon. Enjoy the lunch. Thanks again to the People's Kitchen. And then get ready for your workshops. And see you back here in the evening plenary. Thank you all. Uh, hello, my name is Antonio Galan. I live here in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, I am a member of Champlain Valley DSA, the, de the local chapter of the Democratic Socialists of uh, America. Uh, and I'm one of the organizers of, uh, of this conference. Uh, and after the, the plenary, the, the beginning of the conference, I could say we're pretty happy with, with the turnout. Uh, and excited to have a day of connecting with other uh, Palestine uh, activists, Pal Palestine solidarity activists, uh, and hoping to be more organized and more informed moving forward. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle McCormick. I'm with Cooperation Vermont and the Cooperation Vermont Community Land Trust, and we are members of the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. We are here at the Old North End Center today in Burlington for the uh, Struggle for Land and Liberation conference to really learn more about what all has been going on, like most recently, but historically, about the conflict in Palestine and what can be done towards Palestinian liberation, and to connect with other folks who are trying to learn more, but also who are organizing in our community throughout throughout Vermont. We've got people from all over the state here today. And um, and to, to figure out how we can organize better to take action in the future for a sustained movement. Hi, I'm Ashley Smith. I'm a member of the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. I'm here today at the Vermont Palestine Conference, the struggle for land and liberation. And we have brought well over 200 people here today together to talk about learning more about Palestine, connecting with each other, organizing ourselves collectively, and beginning to take action to build solidarity with Palestine, to pass apartheid-free community ballot measures in towns and cities across Vermont, and to prepare for a long struggle to impose boycott, divestment, and sanctions on every single institution, every single organization, and the whole city town and state system of Vermont, because Vermont needs to stand with Palestine. We are wasting trillions of dollars a year on the U.S. war machine. We are wasting millions and millions and millions of dollars a year on arming Israel to carry out genocide in Palestine. And today we're saying this must stop. And we are organizing for the long haul to make sure that victory is won in Palestine, that there's a free Palestine from the river to the sea, a singular secular democratic state with rights for all. And that kind of justice will guarantee peace in Palestine and with it a liberated Middle East. And in liberating the Middle East, we'll free ourselves because all the money that goes to the war machine can go to helping people there and helping people here. We want to put people before profit and empire.
Hi, I'm Theo Wheeland. I work for the nurses and the techs union uh, here in Burlington, Vermont. And today's a beautiful Saturday uh, in October. We are gathering for the Palestine conference. We have an incredible turnout. I'm really surprised to see so many people from so many places, uh, labor activists, uh, Palestinian activists, um, people of many different movements um, and experiences have come together um, to share tips and tricks um, and organizing tactics of how we are going to uh, end Israeli apartheid, end the war. Uh, we want to see peace in the Middle East. We want to see peace around the world. Um, you know, we're workers that um, make you know, all the wealth in this society, and we see a, a trillion dollars every year going into war. Um, and it just doesn't make sense when we have homeless people, when we have student debt, uh, when we have hungry people. We, I, I just saw today in the news that scurvy is back in America because um, workers uh, don't have enough money to uh, purchase broccoli and vegetables uh, and oranges. Um, and, you know, just shouldn't be like that, right? We've, we've never lived in a wealthier time in America. Um, we, people shouldn't be homeless. Uh, people shouldn't be struggling to pay rent. You know, we want the trillion dollars every year that we produce to go to housing, healthcare, and social services. Um, we want, uh, you know, we want a labor movement that doesn't just fight for higher wages and benefits, but also um, knows that the uh, the success of the labor movement is international. It, it depends on workers around the world succeeding, right? So if, if we're doing well here in America, uh, factory owners can build factories in Mexico or in China or in Bangladesh, right, and outsource our jobs. And of course, they've done that for 50 years. And um, we know that the solution is to unionize around the world um, and to have an international perspective. And, and what, what uh, you know, the bosses often want to do is they want to pit us against each other. They want to pit us against each other at work, along gender lines, along race lines, along language lines, uh, around you know, meritocracy. Oh, I have this degree, I have that degree, this certification, that certification. But I mean, look at Trump and, and um, Kamala. They also want to divide us along uh, national lines. You know, of who's in, who's out, who's a citizen, who's not a citizen. You know, who got here yesterday and who got here a couple generations ago. And we reject um, those divisions. We know that we're stronger together and we're safer together. So we like to say safety through solidarity. And Zionism you know, started with the premise of the only safe place is a place that's entirely run by Jews. And so people in the 1880s, they looked around earth, where can we have a, a Jewish homeland? And um, you know, they looked at different spots. There's a spot in Africa, a spot in, in uh, Russia, I believe. Um, and, uh, and for many different political reasons, they, they ended up going with Palestine. And that core premise of our safety has to come at the expense of other people, other people's land. Um, that's something that Jews all around the world are rejecting uh, in this moment, increasingly so. Uh, and in its place, um, I think a, a slogan that's much more suitable to the labor movement is rising up, which is safety through solidarity. So what if um, Jewish people can be safe anywhere, right? And the, and the safety will come in uh, solidarity of people recognizing that we have mutual interests. Every person on earth wants a good job, you know, water, housing, health care, education. We all pretty much want the same thing. We want to live in peace and live and let live. Um, and yeah, and so that's uh, why we're gathered here today to try and move that movement forward in many different ways, uh, electorally, in the labor movement, um, in our workplaces, in our, in our uh, communities, in the streets with, with street protests, peaceful protests, things like that. Um, and yeah, we think we're going to win. I mean, there's countries all around the world. I saw just yesterday the prime minister of Italy, who's uh, by no means a leftist. I mean, I think she's the 
granddaughter of Mussolini or something like that. Um, she's on the right wing of Italy, but she has said, we're not sending any more weapons to Israel. Um, you know, I think Keir Starmer has said similar things like that. Macron in France has said that. So, you know, these are not left wing people and they're just recognizing that the government of Israel is out of control. Um, Netanyahu is out of control. Um, you know, they, they the, these, uh, you know, right wing European leaders will, would not make the same criticism of Zionism like us in this room, you know, but they're recognizing something needs to be done to protect innocent people uh, from this senseless war. And uh, uh, this week, Greek workers, uh, Greek dock workers blocked a supply of uh, bullets to Israel. Um, and yeah, I mean, that I think is the path forward is each person, wherever they're at, doing what they can in their own way uh, to, to stop the war and bring peace and bring reconciliation um, and bring justice uh, to that situation. So that's why I'm here. I'm stoked at the turnout. I've already met some great people. Um, if you're here in town, come on over. If you're watching this later, uh, watch the panelists. There's a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn from each other. There's activists in this room that have been working on this for decades, uh, and they'll be educating all of us. Uh, we have a lot to learn and a lot to do together. Hey, my name is Joe Kane. I'm the Ward 3 City Councilor. And I am so proud of my community uh, for, for putting together and and showing up for an event like this, the Vermont Palestine Conference. Um, this is an issue uh, that we need to uh, educate people about. Um, and and the people of Burlington um, have uh, shown a great interest in, in this topic. We've turned out huge numbers to events since October 7th. Um, even before October 7th, uh, when this phase of the genocide started, I was going door to door I was already knocking on people's doors, uh, trying to get people to sign up for the American Friends Service Committee, Apartheid Free Community Pledge. And people were very interested in this topic. Um, this community is really special uh, and, and can show leadership for uh, communities uh, around the country and around the world. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see where things go. Hi, I'm Jill, and Crystal is with me as well. We're th we are with the Vermont Peace Anti-War Coalition. We use the acronym VPAC, and we're here at the VCPL Conference for Palestinian Liberation, and we are taking names of people. We have buttons to give out. Um, we want to mobilize people all over Vermont, which is what we've been doing for the year and a half that we've been in existence and right now we have a couple of special projects I want to tell you about one is the play one family in Gaza which the um, the playwright is right here with me crystal it's based on her daily communication with a young father in Gaza and it tells the story of a war that's still going on. It's very simple to put on, it's very moving, and it's a great conversation starter with people uh, who any peace activists might know who need to understand the gravity of the situation and we are offering an orientation session where you can put this on. We're also going to be starting uh, peace vigils at the General Dynamics plant in Williston and a webinar about the insidious nature of the military industrial complex on our communities and economy in Vermont and around the, world, the, around the country. I'm Andy Simon. I'm with the Champlain Valley chapter of an organization called Jewish Voice for Peace. And we're here at the uh, Palestine Conference to talk to people about what Jewish Voice for Peace is. It's a group of primarily Jewish people in Vermont and New Hampshire and all over the country and all over the world who are standing for in solidarity with Palestine and with Palestinian liberation. And we want to be a Jewish voice to speak uh, to that issue because so often people who are in solidarity with Palestine are attacked as anti-Semitic. And so a Jewish voice has been, and this has been since 
you know, for 40 years. The Jewish Voice for Peace has been speaking out on this issue and uh, now locally has uh, something like 800 members who are in Vermont and New Hampshire working on this issue.